Who, who doesn't like rock and roll? Hey, rock and roll's dead. They said that in 1957, yeah? They were wrong then, too. They've been described as the meanest band in the world. They've influenced some of the biggest names, including Metallica, Megadeth, and even Slayer. And frontman Lemmy Kilmister is without doubt one of the most iconic musicians to ever grace a stage. Like this. They carved out their own history, doing things their own way, with classic albums such as Overkill, Get it back to you. Bomber, Survivor. Survivor. and of course, Ace of Spades. Many have even cited the trio as a key influence in opening the door for the new wave of British heavy metal that gave way to Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and more. It's almost impossible to talk about the origins of rock and metal music without hearing their name, and rightly so. They released an incredible 23 studio albums spanning a 40-year career and became known as one of the hardest working and hardest partying bands in the history of heavy metal. This is Born to Raise Hell, the story of the one and only Motorhead. December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1945. Just three months after World War II had come to an end, true to form, Ian Fraser Kilmister was born five weeks premature. Yeah, we come up from the gutter. It seemed the man that would be built for speed couldn't even be held back by nature herself. His father was in the RAF during the war, but decided to walk out on his family three months after Lemmy was born, leaving his mother and grandma to raise the newborn Hellraiser. Despite this, Lemmy may have acquired some genetic musical talent from his estranged father, as he was supposedly quite an accomplished pianist during his younger years. Lemmy started life in Stoke-on-Trent, located in the West Midlands, England, but would eventually end up in a school in Wales, and his rebellious nature would shine through almost immediately. I had problems at school right from the start. The teachers and I didn't see eye to eye. They wanted me to learn, and I didn't want to. I played truant constantly, and that was it from day one. Whilst he didn't have a great time in school as a kid, one thing came from it which was his name, Lemmy, which he's been known by since about the age of 10 years old. Lemmy found other ways to entertain himself aside from ignoring his schoolwork. He and some friends would break into a construction site on the coast of Anglesey and steal dynamite, detonators and fuses and spend his days blowing huge holes in the beach and surrounding rocks. Lemmy really seemed to be interested in being louder than life from an early age, so it's no surprise he started the loudest band on earth. It wouldn't be until a few years later though when he discovered the magic of a guitar and the mysterious power it held over the opposite sex when he would decide he wanted to become a musician. He picked up the guitar because he saw another kid at school with one surrounded by women and simply thought, well, that's the job for me. For the first 10 years of his life, rock and roll didn't even exist. It wouldn't be until he discovered Bill Haley and his Comets in 1955 that Lemmy would develop his love for this newly emerging genre. Although it wasn't exactly the type of rock and roll people became familiar with, thanks to the likes of Elvis and Chuck Berry. It still played an important role in the development of Motorhead. The first single Lemmy ever bought was of Tommy Steele, the UK's answer to Elvis, and his first album, The Buddy Holly Story by Buddy Holly, released in 1959. Buddy Holly would become an idol for Lemmy as well as Eddie Cochran, both of whom inspired him to play guitar, along with trying to pick up women, of course. 
I decided to pick up the guitar partly for the music, but the girls were at least 60% of the reason I wanted to play. I discovered what an incredible pussy magnet guitars were at the end of the school year. Shortly after this, Lemmy would teach himself how to play his mum's Hawaiian guitar in the late 50s when he was around 12 years old. And not surprisingly, what followed was a string of girls inviting themselves to his bedroom on a regular basis. He was already living the rock and roll lifestyle, so naturally the next stage of his path to stardom would be getting expelled from school at 15 and joining his first band. Lemmy played in a few local bands in Wales, then started bands with some friends, the Sundowners and the DJs, mostly playing cover songs by Ricky Nelson, when we walk in the, sand of a wacky key and I... the Shadows, and the Venturas. saw some small success with a band called The Rocking Vickers from 1965 to 1967 before heading to London to try and be a star in his own right. And before long, he'd find himself joining the psychedelic space rock band Hawkwind. He played with Hawkwind from 1971 to 1975 and even provided vocals for their biggest UK hit single, Silver Machine, which reached number two on the charts in 1972. But as we all know, Hawkwind would merely become a precursor for Lemmy's true calling. In May of 1975, he was arrested at the Canadian border on drug charges and the band decided to fire him after they played the show in Toronto. On his return to England, Lemmy would form a new band, a band he described as the dirtiest rock and roll band in the world. If we moved in next door, your lawn would die. And that band would be Motorhead. The point is this, drugs make you feel better. And as long as they do, people will want them. And as long as people want them, somebody somewhere is going to show up with them. Over the years, Motorhead would consist of what we can now call two classic lineups. Lemmy would originally work with guitarist Larry Wallace and drummer Lucas Fox before quickly being replaced by Phil Taylor, better known as Filthy Animal and Fast Eddie Clark from 1975 and 1976 respectively. The next classic lineup would be solidified between the years of 1984 and 1992 with Phil Campbell, Mickey D and Michael Wurzel Burston although Wurzel would part ways with the group in 1995, leaving Lemmy, Mickey and Phil as the last lineup in Motorhead that would continue until 2015. When Motorhead formed in 1975, rock music was very much in its early stages, although the early 70s did see the likes of Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, T-Rex, Alice Cooper, and Jimi Hendrix topping the charts, so it was certainly on the public radar. And we can't forget Black Sabbath's debut record released on Friday the 13th, 1970, reaching number 8 on the UK charts and number 23 on the US Billboard charts in June of the same year, followed by a number 1 position in the UK for their second LP, Paranoid also released in 1970, which was essentially the official birth of heavy metal. Motorhead, though, almost never happened. They played their first show on July the 20th, 1975 at the Roundhouse in London, supporting Blue Oyster Cult. And over the next couple of years, they would receive very little attention until one day early in 1977, Phil Taylor and Fast Eddie decided to quit the band. The trio did, however, agree to a farewell show at the Marquee Club on April the 1st of the same year. And if it wasn't for what took place next, the name Motorhead would have been lost to the ages and Ace of Spades never would have been written. The band wanted a live recording of their final show, so Lemmy asked Ted Carroll, the owner of Chiswick Records, if he could make it happen. The problem was the Marquee Club wanted £500 for the recording, 
So Carol instead offered the band two days in a recording studio to record a single. And in true Motorhead fashion, they recorded 13 tracks in total, eight of which would go on to be the first Motorhead album. And they did all of this in 48 hours with no sleep, their performance being naturally enhanced by their namesake. Prior to this, Motorhead did release a single in 1977 called Leaving Here. A cover of an Eddie Holland song released back in 1963 on Motown Records, but it failed to chart or make any impact at all. It didn't quite have that Motorhead sound. However, their second single certainly did. It was released on the 10th of June, 1977, and it was called Motorhead. This reworked version was the last song Lemmy had written for Hawkwind and also where the name for the band came from. The name itself is slang for speed freak, someone who uses amphetamines. Two months later, August the 12th, 1977, the first Motorhead album would hit the shelves. Released on Chiswick Records, Motorhead's self-titled debut record would enter the UK charts on the 24th of September 1977, and not only would peak at number 43, it would change rock and metal music forever. By the time Motorhead had come to release their second studio album, Overkill, in 1979, the punk genre was essentially dead, and metal wasn't exactly mainstream either. Although bands such as Judas Priest and Black Sabbath were still dominating a small corner of the music populace, the UK charts in the late 70s were still heavily dominated by pop and disco with the likes of the Bee Gees, ABBA and Kate Bush. People weren't exactly rushing to their local record store to pick up albums that would scare their children half to death. By most accounts, heavy metal was still classed as an underground movement. This era was, however, a pivotal turning point, not only for Motorhead, but for metal music in general. 1979 saw Motorhead release two of their biggest and most popular records. Even to this day, they're still regarded as two of the most important albums in the history of the genre. Overkill would hit the shelves in March, and Bomber would dive into the charts in October. There were indeed plenty of heavy metal bands trying to break through into the mainstream during the late 70s, but none of them could really capture the imagination of the public quite like Motorhead were able to. So what did Lemmy and his band of musical cowboys have that the rest didn't? Well, fast forward to just one year later and Motorhead was set to unleash what is arguably their most memorable record to date. Released in October of 1980, not only did it feature the now iconic single Ace of Spades, the record of the same title was the first studio album released by the raucous trio to showcase the band members themselves on the front cover, and it was one of the most striking images you could hope to see on the front of an album. You adopted the Ace of Spades as your motif. Why the Ace of Spades? Because it's bad luck. Ace of Spades is bad luck, isn't it? See? So we figured if, uh, if we use bad luck as our theme, then it can't get any worse. The Ace of Spades era seems to be when the classic Motorhead image really saw the light of day. Leather jackets, cowboy boots, concho belts, and of course the now legendary bullet belt. This was the mean bad boy rock and roll image that people would come to know and love whenever they heard the name Motorhead or Lemmy Kilmister. And despite the cover looking like it was shot outside an old saloon in the wild west of the American frontier, the photo shoot took place in a sand pit in an area of London called High Barnet. But of course, the public were none the wiser. The one thing that really separated Motorhead from any other band was the attitude. Motorhead were a straight up old school, we don't give a fuck rock and roll band. Not only this, Lemmy came across as just your average louder-than-life guy. 
He wasn't wearing any fancy blazers like Hendrix, he didn't spruce up his hair like Robert Plant, and he certainly didn't have the pretty boy image of, say, Alvis. Lemmy was simply Lemmy. He was Motorhead, the same as the rest of the band. They were probably the closest thing the average public would ever get to witnessing what you could call the real deal. Motorhead were real-life cowboys straight from the Old West, and this image was solidified with the album cover for Ace of Spades. Combine that with lyrics about gambling, sex and booze, and well, you've got one of the most authentic rock and roll bands to ever step foot on a stage. This was Motorhead, and they played rock and roll. Where did Motorhead's image actually come from? Lemmy essentially started out looking like every other guy in the 60s that would be into taking drugs, getting laid, and trying to make it in a band. We can easily see early on that Lemmy started to adopt what we could call the rocker image. But this aesthetic also seeps through into Motorhead's artwork and even the general themes of the lyrics. And it essentially came from a mixture of his love for early rock and roll music and the war. I was born in 1945, the year it all ended, Lemmy says about the Second World War. It's not ancient history to me, and I don't see it as all the good English and Americans and all the bad Germans. At some point down the line, Lemmy became obsessed with the Second World War and eventually historical war in general. You only have to look at the 1979 album Bomber to see the direct influence of the military on Lemmy's songwriting and creative aesthetic when it came to Motorhead. Then there's the War Pig, Motorhead's vicious-looking mascot. Lemmy just wanted the logo to look evil, and the font type for the name, he simply wanted a gothic style. The two dots over the O idea he stole from Blue Oyster Cult, the dots known as umlaut, most commonly seen in the German language. And as most people will know, Lemmy had quite the soft spot for the German army in particular. In the 2010 documentary film titled Lemmy, we get a glimpse into his life and his apartment in Los Angeles, where he decided to set up home after leaving the UK in the 90s. His home, decorated with military paraphernalia, knives, swords, uniforms and more, mostly from the Second World War. He even once stated that he wanted his bass sound to sound like a World War II bomber, which he certainly achieved. It's one of the things Motorhead became most well known for, that deafening, distorted bass that sounded like no other. This rather niche passion combining rock and roll with military history, along with Lemmy's attitude, is exactly what made Motorhead, Motorhead. And their story is actually incredibly simple. They did exactly what they wanted to do, they didn't take shit from anyone, and they played rock and roll how they wanted to play it. And if you didn't like that, they quite frankly didn't care. We never gave up anything, you know. We never let them do anything to us. We never said, okay, yes, sir, you know. We never did that. We always said, fuck you, you know. And we're still saying it today, which is why we're so broke, you know. <laughs> Over the years, Lemmy would strike up friendships with almost everyone you could think of, from Sid Vicious of the Sex Pistols, to the Ramones, to Metallica, Slash, and even Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters. But one very special connection he would make would be with Ozzy Osbourne. They had known each other from way back in the day when Lemmy was still in Hawkwind and Ozzy was in Black Sabbath as the two bands shared a rehearsal space. Motorhead even supported Ozzy Osbourne back in 1981 during his Blizzard of Oz tour that was in support of his debut solo record, Blizzard of Oz, that came after he was kicked out of Black Sabbath. But this didn't just result in a lifelong friendship. Lemmy would write one of his biggest hit songs, and it would be a song called Mama, I'm Coming Home, written for Ozzy Osbourne's 1991 record, No More Tears. 
Lemmy also wrote three other songs on the same album, I Don't Want to Change the World, Desire and Hellraiser, a song that would feature on the 1992 supernatural horror film Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth. And quite frankly, the songs Hellraiser and Born to Raise Hell are two of the most fitting songs that Lemmy could have ever written to describe himself and his band. Because that's exactly what the band were and exactly what they did. They were Hellraisers born to raise Hal. Motorhead were and are still known as one of the loudest bands to ever walk the earth. And the only thing louder than their music is their legacy. Motorhead weren't just a band, they were a culture, they were a genre in their own right. And when you have people like Ozzy Osbourne and Metallica looking up to Lemmy and Motorhead, it's hard to deny that Motorhead were the greatest rock and roll band that we'll ever witness. There will be no other. When I decided to put this documentary together, with Motorhead being my absolute heroes and have been for many years, I thought it would end up being at least an hour long. There are countless stories about Motorhead and Lemmy that I could have included, but ultimately, these stories should only be told by one man, and that man is Lemmy. So just like Motorhead, I wanted to keep this simple. It would have been a complete disservice to Motorhead and Lemmy to try and pad this documentary out just to make it longer. So I guess it's more of my personal tribute to a band and a man that meant more to me than the music itself ever could. Born to lose, live to win. Motorhead forever. Can we go now? Yeah.